Hi everyone, my name is Alyosha and I'm a postdoc at Dynamic Vision and Learning Group at Technical University of Munich. Today I'll be talking about 3D object detection, tracking and segmentation. So robots, such as this one that you can see in top left corner here, need to detect and track objects to be able to navigate around the world. And in real-world robotic scenarios, it is vital that in addition to localizing objects' images, we also understand where exactly these objects are in 3D space and how do they move. Only this way, they can react to obstacles in time and ensure safety for all traffic participants. So when it comes to perception, therefore, one of the key tasks that we need to solve is 3D multi-object tracking. In past lectures, you already heard about multi-object tracking and the most common approach to vision-based multi-object tracking, which is tracking by detection. So here, in this case, you need to train object detector for specific target classes that you want to track. And the challenge then is to match object detections to tracks, so associated to associate these detections over time. And uh, this is a very difficult problem because often we are working in really crowded scenarios, so it's not easy to distinguish individual uh, pedestrians or any other target classes. And of course, object detectors can be sometimes quite unreliable. So it's quite common to frame this association problem as bipartite matching between the trajectory set and the detection set. That is, so this detection set is usually obtained in the most recent frame. To this end, we need to define association costs between these two sets. It's quite common to take both object appearance and motion into account for these costs. So, for example, you can train object re-identification model using deep neural networks. You can predict where object bounding box of the trajectory will appear in the next frame. And then the cost could be expressed as a combination of distance between object appearance vectors and intersection over union between predicted and observed or detected bounding box. So now let's discuss what changes when you look at this problem from the robotics perspective. So first, different to vision-based object detection tracking, in this case, we can actually leverage a large variety of sensors, such as, for example, stereo cameras, LiDAR sensor, RGBD sensors, and so forth. And these sensors provide us implicitly or explicitly with seen depth information, or provide us with scans that uh, come in form of 3D point clouds that represent surface measurements of the environment. This means that for 3D object tracking, we can use this rich geometric information that is encoded in these point clouds. And therefore, this can help us to overcome several challenges that we encounter in the field of image-based tracking, such as uh, sensitivity to occlusions, illumination, and scale variations. One reason for this is that when reasoning directly in 3D space, it becomes significantly easier to devise strong motion models compared to reasoning about motion in the image domain, where everything is distorted due to the perspective projection. So to illustrate this point, um, look at this sketch over here. So here you can see two 3D motion vectors of the same magnitude, but they are observed at different uh, distances from the optical sensor. When we project this to, to one-dimensional plane, in this case, this is line, you can see visually that the magnitude of the projected velocity vector uh, vectors depends on a distance from, uh, from the sensor. So this means that in the projection process, we actually lose important information that helps us to disentangle magnitude of the velocity vector and distance from the sensor. Um, and of course, this means that if we rely on projected velocity vectors to devise motion models, it will appear that that uh, it will appear that as objects are getting closer to the sensor, that they are moving faster, but uh, but they really are not. Finally, while reasoning in 3D space, we can also leverage simple geometric uh, prior knowledge about the structure of 3D scene. So, for example, it is quite reasonable to assume that all objects of interest will be moving on a flat surface below the sensor 
But this means that we can effectively estimate the ground plane and track uh, objects uh, as they are constrained to that uh, plane. Now, I mentioned that we can use several sensors, not only cameras, but these sensors also have their limitations. So, for example, they have limited scan range, and very often sensor resolution is decreasing with distance from the sensor. So in case of LiDAR, when we are far from the sensor, we um, it is really, really difficult to infer from the observations which uh, what kind of object they are representing. Um, so LiDAR also has problems with reflective and low albedo surfaces, and it is essentially blind to these areas. Stereo cameras, on the other hand, struggle with depth estimation in poorly textured areas. And even in areas where establishing matches is possible, 3D localization error grows quadratically with the distance from the sensor. When it comes to learning, it needs to be noted that 3D point clouds are quite different to images. These are sparse and unstructured uh, signals, so it is still an open question on how to learn representations from such data. Another open question is how should we optimally combine information from multiple sensors? And finally, in robotic scenarios, we need to be able to localize objects not only in image domain, but also in 3D space. And this precise localization is actually very challenging. So if you look at uh, this example here, um, this 2D bounding box in image defines this large view thrust on. And within this thrust, we need to be able to determine object size, orientation, and distance from the sensor. So multi-object tracking has its origins in the realm of naval and airline navigation. And in this case, as tracking was usually done based on sensors such as sonar or radar that provide us with uh, point measurements of objects. Historically, <clears throat> multi-object tracking methods were focusing on modeling object dynamics to be able to track these objects reliably. Of course, it was not possible to devise uh, appearance models for when you when you're using such sensors. In terms of robotics, in early days, robots were equipped with uh, 2D line laser sensors. So this provides us with distance measurements to static structures as well as moving regions, but only sense uh, a slice of the visual world. It needs to be noted that it is really difficult to detect objects in uh, such scans. For example, people. So if you look at this scan over here, can you actually spot people? I think it's really difficult. You ha can have somewhat feeling that uh, here are some walls, but here, this area over here just looks like a lot of clutter. Here at the bottom, you can actually see typical scan signatures for persons. So we, essentially, because sensors are usually placed at the bottom, uh, you, what you can observe here are, um, are legs of uh, persons walking around. Back then, it was really essential to track these regions because simple frame scan evidence was very difficult to interpret, and it was quite important to um, to to leverage sequence level, uh, sequences here. When it comes to three D multi object tracking in automotive and outdoor scenarios, this uh, this became more relevant in two thousand five in the time of autonomous ground vehicle challenge that was organized by uh, DARPA. Of course, to be successful at these tasks, this task, vehicles had to keep track of all dynamic surrounding objects. And um, these vehicles were largely relying on LiDAR sensors that you can see here on top. And here in this picture, you can see winner of 2005 uh, challenge. Um, here you can see uh, the leader of the uh, Stanford team, Sebastian Tran, and the uh, vehicle Stanley that won, won this challenge. So let's have a quick look on how this was working back then. So remember, this was in times before deep learning was cool again. So 
So we had vehicle according data. Vehicle was providing us with uh, full 3D LiDAR scans, 360 scans. And um, we would take each LiDAR scan and then segment this LiDAR scan based on spatial proximity of 3D points. So the reasoning behind this was that points that are close in 3D space are measurements of the surface of the same object. So um, even quite simple algorithm could give us uh, point cloud segmentation. So could could extract a segment such as those that you can see here. So example of such segmentation algorithm would be that we fit a ground plane to 3D point cloud, and then we project points to the ground. And in this way, we obtain some sort of two-dimensional bird of view or density map of uh, the point cloud. You can actually treat this density map now as a graph and simply find segments by finding uh, connected components of this graph, in this graph. And then if you kept track of which points projected to which bin, you could, um, you could recover point uh, segments. Then to track objects, we would associate these uh, regions over time. So I would like to note here that what I'm describing here is not really tracking by detection because we did not train object detector to recognize certain object classes. Instead, we were relying uh, on uh, low level cues to do grouping, such as spatial proximity. Now, of course, certain agents such as uh, cars and pedestrians are very important and commonly occurring objects. So we would still like to recognize them, even though we would like to track all, uh, all objects. Um, and uh, what um, what we can do this in this case is we can take these segments and we can project them to virtual views. And then we can run object classifier based on these point projections. You can see such point projections here. So this is what you want to classify. So nowadays, you, of course, you would take your favorite uh, convolutional feature extractor, you would add softmax classifier on top and you would train everything end to end. But uh, back then, histograms of oriented gradients were popular approach for feature extraction in the vision community. So back then in this work, this is uh, what the authors of this paper used. Here at the bottom, you can see results back projected to the image. So here we color code recognize object classes. So red are cars, uh, green cyclists, and blue are, are pedestrians. What you can see here is that in addition to uh, detecting and segmenting um, the cars, pedestrians, and cyclists, we also obtain segments representing uh, static, static uh, background structures. Um, so takeaway here is not really that you should use connected components algorithm to segment your point clouds and use histograms of oriented gradients to classify these regions. Um, I think that there is different powerful message before, behind this, uh, this work. And this is tracking should be agnostic to recognition. With such an approach, if an animal would jump in front of the vehicle and we, we didn't train our classifier to recognize this animal, um, we would still have opportunity to react on this, um, on this object. And this is very important for robotics. Um, also, this, this paradigm of uh, segmenting and tracking objects before necessarily recognizing them somewhat goes in hand with the field of developmental psychology because there's quite some evidence that uh, infants actually learn to segment and track objects already at very early stages of development before they're actually re able to recognize semantics of objects. Um, so, of course, the question on how to learn to segment and track objects remains open. Um, and I think this is, um, this is a very exciting area of research. In the reminder of this lecture, we will actually be focusing on tracking by detection paradigm because these methods are nowadays very well understood and we, made, we have made significant progress as a community in recent years. Um, it uh, should be also mentioned that 
one issue with the paradigm that I just mentioned is that it turns out that segmentation is very difficult. Um, even though, in principle, this approach that I just presented for segmentation works reasonably well, um, it will fail in crowded scenarios and when objects are interacting. So, for example, if you have two pedestrians walking nearby together, we can end up under-segmenting them. And uh, it is, of course, desirable to segment each individual object instance because uh, these instances might at any point start uh, diverging in terms of motion, and it's important that we, uh, we detect that quickly. Also, sensor resolution is decreasing with distance from the sensor, and we will have holes in scans due to reflective and lower video surfaces. And this also means that uh, uh, such an approach can also uh, um, produce over segmentations of objects. And again, we would like to uh, we would like to segment and detect object as whole. Um, so, um, yeah, segmentation is definitely a difficult problem. And uh, meanwhile, in vision-based multi-object uh, tracking, um, object detection-based tracking was actually proven very successful. And of course, a natural question that occurs here is how far we can get with such vision-based really multi-object tracking. So in this case, we are assuming a sensor set up that's equipped with stereo cameras, and we assume that we have trained image-based object detector for object classes that we would like to track. And now, one of the main questions uh, was at the beginning, given to the object detections in image domain, how we can reliably localize them in 3D space. Remember that this um, we started investigating this in times when 2D object detectors were barely starting to work reliably, and 3D detectors, reliable 3D detectors, were not really available yet. Um, so one possibility that was explored in uh, early um, 3D multi-object tracking approaches was to send a ray through bottom point of 2D object detection, and we intersect this ray with uh, 2D estimated ground plane in 3D space. Um, so um, this actually does work, but uh, when we were working on this problem, we observed that this yields large 3D localization error in practice. Even if we are off by one pixel, this in image domain, this can translate to error of few meters in 3D space. Um, so, um, to, uh, because of that, we used in our work stereo point clouds to localize 2D object detections in 3D space. So, in one of the methods that we proposed, we over-segmented stereo point clouds using um, several different clustering parameters. Uh, this was to ensure that we had several different segmentation hypotheses in our uh, set of segmentations. And then before tracking, we would associate these 3D segments, these clusters, with uh, 2D detections. And uh, if the association was successful, then we could precisely localize these object detections in the stereo point cloud, up to a certain distance from camera, of course. Um, one of the important properties of this method was that we were uh, um, jointly keeping track of uh, 2D, 3D state, so in 2D image domain and 3D space. And this actually allowed us to update track states not only when 3D localized detections were available, but also when we could not localize detections, um, when you could only localize detections in 2D space. And this actually did uh, happen from time to time. So, for example, it would commonly happen when objects were more than 30 meters away from camera or in severely occluded scenarios. And this really turned out to be crucial for good performance because in uh, this setting, we could uh, track objects even at far ranges where stereo was really very unreliable. This method was also the first 3D multi-object tracking entry in the popular KIT-T multi-object tracking benchmark. And nowadays, 3D multi-object tracking is actually a very popular and vibrant field of research, as you will see soon. Um, 
this method was state of the art when it was published. Uh, so, of course, when uh, evaluated on um, Kitty dataset using public region, let's uh, object uh, detections. But what is interesting is that now, even now, four years, years later, this method is still one of the top performers in online setting when comparing uh, with methods that use exactly the same in inputs to perform tracking. So this table that I'm showing here is actually taken from recent end-to-end -end multi average tracking approach that was published at uh, ICC last year. And as you can see, um, our method is um, second best performing method uh, report, as reported by this paper. Of course, this recent end-to-end -end multi object tracking approach outperforms our, our approach. Um, so I have a, just a short note on, on evaluation. So in previous lectures, you already discussed how to evaluate performer, performance of object detectors and multi-object trackers. And here we will be using exactly same evaluation measures. The only thing that will change is the way that we evaluate overlap. So before you would compute overlap between predictions and ground truth, um, as to the intersection over union based on 2D bounding boxes that are defined in image domain. Now we will be computing this overlap by computing 3D intersection over union based on 3D bounding boxes. So we would like to track objects in 3D space. In addition to images, we would also like to leverage sensors that provide us with signals that come in the form of 3D point clouds. In continuation of this lecture, we will assume, without loss of generality, that we have a LiDAR sensor that directly gives us such a 3D point cloud. And remember that to track objects, we first need to be able to detect them, so let's talk about 3D object detection first. Now for tasks such as object classification, detection, and semantic segmentation, we first need to be able to learn a feature representation of the input signal suitable for the task at hand. And of course, we want to learn this representation in an end-to-end -end manner. Now, typical convolutional architectures that you heard about in this lecture assume regular input data formats, for example, image grids or 3D voxels. Therefore, one obvious thing to do when working with such signals is to convert them in a 3D volumetric representation. In this case, we, we could leverage 3D convolutional backbone, for example. However, this approach would be quite memory consuming and we would need to discretize input signal. Another natural idea would be to project unstructured point cloud in 2D virtual cameras and then use image-based methods to perform classification based on these 2D views. We were already talking about this approach in the context of 3D LiDAR tracking. Of course, nowadays, we would not use histograms of oriented gradients to extract, uh, uh, to extract feature representation based on this virtual use, but we would leverage convolutional neural networks. Of course, it would be really great if we could, if we could learn representations directly from point clouds. Um, point clouds are directly obtained from sensors, so there would be no discretization or any kind of force processing required here. However, until recently, it was really not clear how to learn picture representations directly based on input data that comes in form of a structured point set. This actually changed with the seminal paper by Ki et al. Important contribution of this paper was to show the community how to use deep neural networks to learn representations for unstructured point sets, such as 3D point clouds. And now let's briefly talk about uh, how this works. So let's say for simplicity that we would like to classify objects based on some input signal. So if I asked you that given images as input, how can we train a classifier that recognizes what is the class of the object present in the image? You would all know where to get off the shelf pre-trained convolutional backbone, such as ResNet, for example, that you would use to extract convolutional features and you would add your softmax, softmax classifier on top. 
Now, assume that we want to classify raw point clouds. The question is now, what kind of network can we use as a backbone to extract such a represent extract representation of this point set, suitable for training object classifier in end-to-end -end manner? What is now really important here is that this representation should be invariant to permutations of signal. And it should be invariant to, to, geometric, to geometric transformations. So let's first discuss permutation variance. Let's say that we have n dimensional points. Of course, in general case of 3D point clouds, we can assume that dimensionality equals 3 here. Now, if I change the order of points in my data structure, I still have exactly the same point set. And this means that I should obtain exactly the same feature representation of this signal. So to be invariant to such permutations, our feature extraction function should be a symmetric function. A function of n variables is symmetric if its value is the same no matter the order of its arguments. So the output should remain unchanged for any permutation of the variables. Two examples of such symmetric functions are shown here, max function and the sum function. So regardless of how you permute, uh, permute uh, inputs to these functions, output will always be the same. So now the main question is how to construct such symmetric functions that can be parameterized by neural networks. So the general idea is sketched here in this slide. So to approximate a general function defined on the point set, authors of PointNet here propose to apply symmetric function on transformed elements of the set. So in, the, in this case, only the function g here needs to be symmetric function. Function, uh, function uh, h, um, fu function h that operates on individual points can be parameterized in this case by a neural network. So in this particular case, for the function g here, authors propose to use max pooling function. This way we obtain a global feature vector representing our signal that is actually permutation invariant. And this can be directly used for classification. You would just add a multi-layer perception on top. And this way, what we basically do is we learn a spatial encoding of each point, and then we aggregate all individual point features to a global fixed dimensional point cloud signature, on top of which we can add our softmax classifier. And now we actually know how to train a network for point cloud classification in end-to-end -end manner. Now, this will work as long as our point clouds were transformed to a canonical or coordinate frame. But we would actually like to relax this assumption and be invariant to geometric transformations, such as rigid transformations. Um, the one way to do that is actually rather straightforward. We need to align input set to canonical space before feature extraction. And uh, the way that, uh, that authors propose to do that in PointNet is that we predict affine transformation matrix by a mini network called TNet and then just apply this estimated transformation on the coordinates of the input points. Um, this mini network uh, is very similar to the bigger point net network. It's composed of the same basic modules. So we have point independent feature extract extractor, max pooling layer and fully connected layer that uh, gives us the trans estimate of the transformation. Then after we 
transformed or points, we can apply the feature extraction procedure as we discussed before. Okay, so now we know how to learn feature representation for unstructured point sets. Um, but um, the problem, problem that uh, that authors of this method observed is that point net does not capture well local structures, and this global representation actually depends on absolute coordinates. And because of that, it was observed that this uh, method doesn't generalize very well. Um, actually, if you look at uh, convolutional architectures. It turned out that it's really important to exploit local structures. For example, a convolutional neural network takes data defined on regular grids as an input, then progressively captures features on increasingly larger scales along the multi-resolution hierarchy. So for example, here, at lower levels, neurons would have smaller receptive fields, and at higher levels, we neurons would have larger receptive fields. And this ability to abstract local patterns along the hierarchy allowed for quite good generalization. And, um, and the successor of PointNet, PointNet++, was, um, was uh, motivated by these observations. So in case of uh, PointNet++, the idea would be to first partition the set of points into overlapping local regions and then extract local features capturing fine geometric structures from small neighborhoods. Local features are then grouped into larger units and pro processed further to produce higher level features. And this procedure would be repeated until we obtain uh, features of the whole point set. So at the end, this gives us our point cloud representation that can be directly used for tasks such as segmentation and classification. So, for example, for classification, for classification, uh, we would take point set from the lowest set abstraction layer, and uh, then add a pooling layer followed by fully connected layers. In case of semantic segmentation, we want to get labeling of each original point. And because of that, we actually need to propagate uh, features from subsample points back uh, back to the original points. Uh, and then by interpolation, uh, we can get per point classification scores. Okay, so Let's see now how we can leverage this knowledge and feature representation learning on the unstructured point sets for the task of 3D object detection. So at the moment, we have, um, we have three leading paradigms to tackle this problem. So the first approach would be to use image-based detector to first detect objects in images and then we can pose 3D object detection as a task of localizing objects in a point cloud that is obtained by cropping out a point set defined by 3D frustum that is defined by this uh, 2D bounding box. So this 2D bounding box here defines this uh, 3D uh, point uh, frustum here. And uh, this is these are the points that we will be um, processing further. So what we would do then here is um, we would encode this point set using, for example, point net. You would perform background, foreground point classification, and then we would regress a 3D bounding box to these foreground points. Now, the second approach is actually based on 3D region proposals and sensor fusion. So for example, having 3D proposals um, uh, defined in a 3D space, we can obtain a 2D crop of this object in the image domain. 
And we can also obtain several, several virtual views of these points. For example, uh, uh, in the image projection or the top-down projection of the LiDAR point cloud. And then we can actually extract convolutional features from each view. And uh, we can then learn to fuse these features before performing uh, um, classification and 3D bound, final 3D bounding box regression. Now, in the third approach, we would follow the idea of faster RCN and object detector. In this case, we will obtain point cloud embedding and generate 3D object proposals. And then we will classify these uh, proposals based on this point cloud embedding. So let's discuss this paradigm in a bit more detail. Okay, so now we know how to learn representations from unordered un un point sets, and we will use here point-based feature extractors for 3D point uh, for 3D point cloud-based object detection. So um, here in point uh, point RCNN, authors propose a two-stage 3D detection network. This is of course um, inspired by faster uh, RCNN detector. And uh, here we will directly generate 3D bounding box proposals and detection results from raw point clouds. So we won't use any image-based information. This seems like a sort of obvious idea, but this is really non-trivial extension faster RCNN because uh, the, the 3D object action problem is quite different from the 2D counterpart. When the, one of the most fundamental differences here is that here we have a really large 3D search space in which we have to find our object proposals. Okay, so now let's discuss first stage of um, this detector. So in the first stage, we will first learn point-wise features using PointNet++ to segment the raw point cloud. So essentially, we will do here some sort of two-class semantic segmentation. We will segment foreground region, re regions of interest from background regions. So regions of interest here in this case would be uh, regions representing cars, pedestrians, cyclists, and so forth. Then we will generate 3D object proposals from the based on the segmented foreground regions. So this means that for each point that was classified as a foreground region, we would spawn a 3D object proposal. Here, 3D object proposals are parametrized as 3D bounding boxes. So which this means that each uh, each bounding box is defined by its uh, 3D center point. Uh, size and um, an orientation angle. Okay, now let's uh, have a look on the second stage network. So in the second stage, we would pull 3D points and their corresponding semantic features from the stage one network according to the location of each 3D, uh, 3D proposal, of course. We would slightly enlarge 3D bounding box to capture more spatial context. And we would transform the pulled features of each proposal to canonical coordinates, so we can, we can learn better local spatial features. Based on transformed and merged feature encoder, we will then refine 3D bounding box and classify this region, just as in case of faster RCNN. And uh, then we would obtain our final output. So it turns out that in practice, this approach works really well. It outperforms all prior, uh, prior work on the car and cyclist class and what is also quite interesting here is that it outperforms methods that use both images and uh, LiDAR as input. 
And actually, this also gives us a hint that we still don't really know how to effectively leverage and combine both sensor modalities. Because right now, the best working method uses only LiDAR as input. On top, you can see quality of results obtained on the KT dataset. So remember that the task of semantic segmentation is to classify each image pixel based on a set of predefined semantic classes. In case of 3D semantic segmentation, we'll be now classifying 3D points. First, a note regarding datasets. So for 3D semantic and instant segmentation, nowadays the most widely used dataset is uh, ScanNet. It contains richly labeled 3D reconstruction of indoor scenes. So in this case, um, the data was recorded using RGBD sensor and then scans were lined to obtain a dense trade reconstruction of the scene. So here, in our case, we will be looking at different, rather robotics and automotive scenarios. So here we will assume that we need to label point clouds that are being captured by a robot or autonomous vehicle in real-world scenarios. This means that these scans will contain also several moving objects. In general, we will need to label single scan as it arrives from the sensor. However, we can also accumulate a few scans within a temporal window to obtain more stable predictions. To do so, we of course need to have information on the motion of the recording vehicle. It became actually only possible very recently to study semantic segmentation in this setting. So actually the results that I'll be presenting here are based on semantic hit the benchmark that was presented at the ICCV last year. Now let's analyze the main findings reported in this paper. So the plot here performance in terms of mean intersection over union for several methods with respect to distance from the sensor. So, as expected here, there is a clear trend of semantic segmentation performance dropping with the distance from sensor. This is not at all surprising because, as we already discussed, the sensor resolution of LiDAR is dropping with the distance from the sensor, so the task becomes more challenging in farther ranges. Now, first thing that we very clearly notice is that point net and its successor that are based on learning position encoding of points, followed by pooling operations, yield in this case surprisingly low performance. So SplatNet um, is based on sparse voxel representation, and it actually does obtain um, better performance up to distance of 20 or 30 meters, but then its performance drops significantly. This is actually not surprising because of the uh, nature of the signal. So resolution here is uh, decreasing with distance from the sensor and we have regular voxel grid discretization of um, the input signal. So this is expected behavior, I would say. What is uh, interesting here is that it uh, turns out that methods that are based on uh, convolutions achieve best performance. So for example, tangent convolutions approach defines convolution operation directly on surface of the point cloud. And as you can see with this approach, we obtain significantly higher mean intersection over union. Furthermore, SQUIZSEC and DarkNet operate on spherical projection of the LiDAR scan. It turns out that, um, so of course, using this representation, we can use 2D convolutional backbones to extract features. And it turns out that um, methods based on this representation turn out to be surprisingly effective. Actually, they achieve uh, top performance uh, with, in, with regard to all um, uh, distance ranges from the sensor. 
So here, based on these findings, we can make conclusion that methods that are based on convolution operator yield best performance for this task. And here, it also seems that projective methods perform better than point-based methods. Um, but actually, if we have a look at the most recent snapshot of these benchmarks, of this benchmark, we can see that recent method that learns point cloud representation directly from raw point sets takes first place again. This approach is, approach is actually also based on uh, convolutions and um, operates directly on the point clouds. To understand this uh, operation proposed in this paper, have a look on this simple uh, 2D example here on the right. So here, input points in gray here are convolved through um, this operator called kpconf. This operator is defined by a set of kernel points visualized here in black. And each kernel point has a filter weight associated to it. These weights are, of course, learnable. This approach is actually inspired by image-based convolutions, but in place of kernel, pixel, of kernel pixels, we use a set of kernel points to define the area where each, where each kernel weight is applied. Um, now let's have a look on 3D panoptic segmentation. So remember from the past lectures that in case of panoptic segmentation, we need to assign to every pixel a semantic class and to all think classes, also instance ID. So in a sense, this task is combination of semantic segmentation and object instance segmentation. And now, as before, the only difference to methods that were discussed um, um, in the context of uh, vision, the only difference is that now we are assigning labels to 3D points rather than image pixels. And again, um, this task was proposed uh, very recently. So on, uh, on this slide, I summarized the main findings of um, of this paper. So in this paper, a simple baseline was proposed. This simple baseline uses two, uh, two networks. One network provides us uh, semantic segmentation of the scene, and the second network is used to detect objects. So this, is, this will be standard 3D object detector that provides us uh, detections localized with uh, 3D bounded boxes. We can then crop out of these uh, crop out points that um, that are within these 3D bounding boxes to obtain instance segmentations. Um, then we use some algorithm that performs some heuristic process, uh, post processing and fuses the results that um, are provided by these two networks. So the main findings are summarized here in this table. And uh, these uh, two baselines use the same 3D object detector called uh, point pillars. And uh, first entry uses kpconf as a, as a backbone, and second is based on the spherical uh, projection presentation of the signal. So as we already see in the previous slide, um, when evaluating semantic segmentation in terms of mean intersection over union, um, the first method performs better because the, this KPConf KP approach is right now state of the art. Um, this also translates to panoptic quality, which is used to evaluate uh, panoptic segmentation. Um, one takeaway from here is that uh, current methods are actually based on two, di two different networks and, uh, and um, heuristically fusing the results. So this means that there are some exciting research opportunities here to do end-to-end -end learning to obtain, um, uh, to train a single network in end-to-end -end manner to obtain, uh, pan obtain panoptic segmentation right. results. 
So we just discussed that now we know how to detect objects reliably in 3D space. Recently, Venk et al. demonstrated that given a reliable 3D object detector, even a simple, simple tracker can actually yield a great performance. And the approach that they proposed is actually based on bipartite matching between set of uh, tracks and object uh, detections. And uh, here, in this case, association costs are pretty much as simple as they can be. They are computed as intersection over union between track predictions and detections. So um, to summarize the whole approach, we have a set of tracks, uh, active tracks, and we get a new frame, a new set of 3D object detections. Um, we will use Kalman filter to predict um, the state of uh, the trajectories in new frame. And then we will compute costs based on 3D intersection or union between the detections and track predictions. And we will fit uh, these association costs to Hungarian algorithm. And Hungarian algorithm will give us association uh, of detections to existing tracks. And then we have some very simple birth and um, uh, death uh, track management um, procedure. So um, at this point, the question is why this simple approach works so well for 3D multi-object tracking? Or alternatively, can we now submit a 2D multi-object tracker to our to our multi to our mod challenge benchmark that will beat everything by simply using Hungarian algorithm and association costs based on 2D intersectional union? Um, so um, to answer that, let's have a bit closer look on um, this approach. So we will here parameterize the state using 3D bounding box, so position, size, uh, orientation, velocity. Um, and uh, the state, as I already mentioned, will be filtered using Kalman filter, which essentially means that we have now a simple physics-based constant velocity motion model that is actually quite commonly used for uh, tracking. And now, because we are reasoning about object position and velocities directly in 3D space, this simple approach actually provides quite reliable motion estimates on the short term. And these reliable motion estimates give us quite accurate predictions of object state in next frame. So this means that uh, this association based on 3D intersection, intersection over union is in this case actually quite reliable. But this would certainly not be the case for 2D bounding boxes defined in the image domain, where we are suffering from projection artifacts and actually objects that are close to the camera appear as they are moving faster. So we were discussing this at the beginning of, uh, of this lecture. Here you can see results um, obtained on 2D uh, Kitty multi-object tracking benchmark. So um, here it needs to be noted that this benchmark always evaluates tracking results in image domain, a 2D multi-object tracking method, of course. Um, and this approach obtains uh, results in image domain by simply projecting 3D trajectory states to, to the image domain. And uh, here in this table, you can see that this, this rather simple approach is actually second best performing method on this benchmark and is by far most efficient. Um, so, so I think that this is, this is actually, even though it's very simple, it's, it's a great contribution. Um, it, it should be noted here, though, that uh, these methods here use different object detectors as inputs. So not only that uh, some use 2D detectors and some 3D detectors, even, uh, even when it comes to 2D and 3D object detectors, they use different methods. So this means that this is not really apple-to-apple -apple comparison. And um, here we actually can see that 3D multi-object tracking is somewhat newer research topic compared to 2D multi-object tracking. 
where task is actually already quite standardized. And for example, on our mod challenge benchmark, different methods need to be evaluated on the same set of uh, object detectors to ensure fair comparison. But regardless of that, I think that this is actually a super exciting time to develop novel 3D multi-object trackers. In this manner, it's really something that it gives you a starting point to develop new methods, uh, and it also will be the first baseline or the for first approach that you will want to outperform. So the only learnable part of uh, this approach was the object detection part. All the rest was actually model-based and handcrafted. The natural extension of this approach would be to leverage representational power of deep neural networks to predict future motion and to code object appearance that can be used as additional cue during the data association. Um, so um, let's have a look on super recent method that was actually presented uh, at CVPR just last month that actually does that. So here, let's have a look again at standard pipeline for multi-object tracking. So um, in the standard pipeline, we would independently for each object extract uh, features. So we would extract features from this, from object tracks and from object detections. We may use 2D or 3D sensor modalities for this, doesn't matter. Based on extracted features, we would compute affinity matrix. So this is, of course, affinity matrix between uh, object tracks and object detections. Based on affinity, we would pass this affinity matrix to Hungarian algorithm that would give us unique assignments between object tracks and object detections. Um, this, of course, means that um, these features are crucial for a liable data association. And um, now, in the case of multi-object tracking method that we just discussed, these features were essentially summarized by a 3D bounding box. So, uh, so this affinity matrix would be computed based on overlap, 3D, 3D bounding box overlap between detections and, um, and track predictions. But actually, nowadays, we have all necessary tools to learn discriminative uh, features for different objects to reduce, confusion, to reduce confusion during data association. And actually, this is already commonly done in 2D multi-object tracking. So actually, this method proposes two novel uh, ideas to the community. So first, instead of learning features for each object independently, uh, this paper argues that we should take other, possibly similarly uh, looking objects into account when, when computing feature representations. Furthermore, they assert that we should take different sensor modalities into account for feature extraction um, and uh, to learn for them both appearance and motion models. So, so we were discussing that motion models are really important for 3D multi-object tracking. And uh, 2D multi-object tracking community has already demonstrated how important appearance, model were, uh, appearance models are. So we should take into account both. So to take interacting objects into the account, they propose to use graph neural networks. So each node that actually represents feature representation of some object track can then update its representation by aggregating features also from other nodes or from other detections and tracks. And then after performing a few iterations of feature aggregation, then the computed affinity matrix should become more discriminative. And the rest, uh, the rest of uh, the tracking pipeline will be exactly the same. Now, regarding the feature representation, um, this paper, of course, argues that uh, 2D and 3D sensor modalities are complementary and we should leverage both for learning discriminative features. So the feature extraction network will, in this case, have four branches. 
two branches for um, uh, uh, for uh, images. So for two D appearance, uh, we will have two D appearance branch and motion branch, and then two branches for three D sensor modality. So for three D appearance and three uh, D motion uh, models. Features features from all four branches will be fused before we will feed them to graph neural network that uh, that you for feature interactions. So now let's see how this works. So um. So feature extractor will obtain features for tracked objects in frame T, um, as well as features for detected objects at time T plus one. Um, and we will utilize both appearance and motion um, motion models. So we will leverage both uh, image information and 3D point clouds. To, uh, to compute these features. So let's first talk about 3D feature extraction, uh, extractor. So first, appearance branch. So appearance branch will crop points from 3D bounding boxes. 3D bounding boxes that present detections and tracks. And then we will encode these points with point net. Um, this networks, uh, this, this network, uh, the weights of this network will be shared. So we will use the same network to encode appearance model for of uh, tracks and detections. Now motion branch will take 3D bounding boxes as input. So for tracked objects, features will be computed using recurrent neural network. So this way we can take past trajectory into account. And in case of detection, we will use multilayer perception. Features for uh, current frame and past state will be then obtained by concatenating uh, motion and appearance features. Um, so the 2D appearance and motion feature extractors are similar. So first of all, 2D features will be computed based on projecting 3D bounding boxes to images. So by projecting 3D bounding box to image, we will uh, obtain a crop representing uh, this object. Then for appearance model, we will extract features using convolutional neural networks. So, so such as uh, ResNet, for example. And weights again will be shared. We will use the same network to extract appearance features from track and from uh, detection. Motion model will be based on 2D bounding boxes this time. And again, uh, this, uh, these features uh, will be computed using recurrent neural network to capture the history of the track. And for detection, we will again use multilayer perception. Then we fuse object features from different branches before we pass them to graph neural network. So basically we will concatenate appearance and motion features for each track and uh, detection. Okay, so uh, now let's have a look on how we um, finally compute uh, features or how to learn representations using graph neural networks. So after feature fusion, we will have um, we will have uh, m features that represent tracked objects, and we will have n features that represent uh, detections, and we will have m plus n features in total. Remember that at this stage, we can compute um, affinity matrix that uh, will be used to compute detection to track assignments. Um, but now we would actually like to take all objects or all nodes into account to obtain um, as discriminative features as possible. And uh, here to this end, this paper proposes to use uh, graph neural networks for this. And the reason is, of course, that one of the key components of graph neural networks is the node feature uh, aggregation mechanism with which a node in the graph can actually update its uh, feature representation by interacting with other nodes. And this is what we, just what you want here. 
Um, so, of course, to use graph neural networks, we will first need to construct the underlying graph. We could go with fully connected graph, but uh, we rather perform gating to focus on uh, feasible associations between detections and tracks. And this way, we will obtain sparse graph. Then, in every layer of the graph uh, neural network, we will perform a number of iterations in which node features will be iteratively updated based on their neighbors. This feature aggregation will be specified by feature aggregation function. And of course, in literature, several different functions were proposed for feature aggregation uh, for graph neural networks. And uh, actually, um, this paper uh, this paper proposes um, proposes to use a two layer two layer multi layer perception that takes difference of two node features as input and outputs a scalar value between zero and one as a pairwise similarity score. So essentially, um, essentially here um, here we compute difference of to feature vectors, so the one at uh, time t represents the track, one at time t plus one represents object detection, um, and um, here sigma one and sigma two represent uh, linear layers of the MLP, and the sigmoid activation function will ensure that uh, this will output scalar value between zero and one as a pairwise similarity score. And this is how we compute uh, an uh, entry for uh, for the affinity matrix. Um, overall, the network is trained at the beginning using triplet loss. Um, and then in later stages, authors also proposed to add additional uh, loss on the affinity matrix. It is pretty much cross entropy loss. Um, so now let's uh, summarize the key results. Um, so first of all, on the Kitty validation split, um, you can see that this approach improves results of the method that we were discussing earlier quite significantly. So for 1.35 uh, motor points. Also, it performs better than other entries uh, on the Kitty benchmark that also leverage both 2D and 3D sensor modalities for multi-object tracking. Um, so, so, of course, it is not surprising that we obtain here uh, that we obtain here better results because uh, now we are um, leveraging more sensor modalities, but uh, also. Um, this uh, this plot at the bottom shows the effect of uh, the feature aggregation mechanism. So here you can see that in terms of MOTA and SAMOTA, accuracy increases as we perform more uh, feature aggregation iterations. Um, and now here we have really interesting ablation study. So um, here in this column, we will use different feature extract, uh, extractors to ablate this approach. So uh, here I'm highlighting the performance that we get in case we use only 2D motion-based uh, features and 3D motion-based features. And here you can see that with 3D motion-based features, we get much higher performance compared to 2D motion-based features. And this shouldn't be surprising. I was already making the case that actually it's really difficult to devise reliable motion models when we are reasoning in uh, projective image space. It becomes much more powerful when we are reasoning in 3D space. Um, but what is actually also really interesting here is that 3D uh, motion-based features are most reliable for data association. If, we, of course, if um, if we use those uh, individually, so this again shows that motion models are really 
powerful like, association cues for uh, 3D multi-object tracking. And uh, I think that in light of this, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a surprising anymore why this simple approach that we discussed earlier works so well. What is also interesting is that here it turns out that 3D motion features are more powerful than 2D appearance features. And these are more powerful than 2D appearance features. I think that this this uh, this is not surprising that 2D appearance features are more powerful because uh, images really provide this very, very rich uh, visual signal for object to identification. I think that here, clear summary is motion cues are super important, but uh, they they are only as so useful when um, when we can devise motion models in 3D space. If we are just looking at 2D counterpart, then of course a parents model is uh, much stronger Q. Um, now I think that um, before commenting uh, on the final results, I would also like to point out here that if we just look at uh, appearance and motion separately, um, um, motion model again, so 2D plus 3D motion model, again, it turns out to be more powerful cue for rate association than 2D and 3D appearance models. This is also interesting. Um, and finally, when you looking only at 2D cues, so 2D motion and appearance versus 3D motion and appearance, again, it turns out that uh, 3D motion plus appearance cues together are more powerful than 2D appearance and motion cues. And, um, and uh, of course, the best result we get when we combine both. So in this case, we get uh, quite significantly um, higher performance compared to 2D or 3D only variants. So um, maybe some of you were a bit disappointed because I was only talking about LiDAR-based tracking all the time. But actually, um, Actually, I would like to highlight here some very interesting recent results. So it actually turns out that if we compute depth map based on stereo or even monocular depth estimation uh, network using images only, and then we convert these depth maps to pseudo LiDAR representation, it essentially mimics the LiDAR, LiDAR signal, we can then apply any existing LiDAR-based detection algorithms and we will get really great performance. And what is really interesting here is that this performance, the uh, performance based on um, uh, stereo, um, uh, stereo uh, uh, depth maps will be actually quite close to the performance that we get purely based on LiDAR. So this I find actually quite interesting. And uh, this somewhat highlights that um, everything we learned so far can be also applied to image-based um, tracking methods. Of course, when uh, tracking objects based on stereo or uh, monocular videos, we should, of course, take the depth uncertainty into account. Because uh, taking, you, you need to take here into account that um, LiDAR depth estimates and um, monocular or stereo depth estimates have very different depth uncertainty characteristics. So in case of stereo, the depth error will go, grow quadratically with uh, distance from the sensor. And I think that this is important to take into account when developing novel um, stereo-based 3D multi-object tracking algorithms. Okay, we are now at the end of this lecture. So um, I would like to recap some takeaways. So um, nowadays we know how to learn representations from unstructured point clouds, point clouds. And I think that this is really great. And because of that, we recently observed um, 
recently observed big improvements in area of 3D object detection, semantic, and instant segmentation. And also because of that, I think that nowadays 3D object detection, tracking, and segmentation are really vibrant and super exciting fields of research. And there are a lot of opportunities to push this field uh, forward. Also, maybe a bit surprisingly, we can actually turn any depth map to a point cloud and we can apply on this representation techniques that we learned about this throughout of this lecture. And I think that this gives us somewhat unified uh, framework, unified view of, of uh, this problem. Okay, that is uh, all for today. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions about the material that I presented today, don't hesitate to send me your questions to my email.